Okay, let's switch gears a little bit. You looked at undesigned coincidences. Let's look at messianic prophecies mm. um, because those are also interesting. If you can show us a few messianic prophecies that is evident in the scriptures. Absolutely. Um, so um, Isaiah 52, 13 through Isaiah 50 through 12 is uh, one of my favorites. Mm. Um, in fact, I think it's my single favor favorite um, example of a messianic prophecy. Isaiah 52, 13 um, begins, Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He should be high and lifted up and should be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. And here we see the priestly function of this messianic servant that's, uh, that's to come. Uh, because the, the priest uh, sprinkles the blood, and so this uh, priest sprinkles uh, the nations. Uh, kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that, which not, for that which has not been told them, they see. And that which they've not heard, they understand. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter. Like a sheep before it shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made a gra his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. And so here we see that not only does this um, servant in Isaiah 53 fulfill the office of priest, but the blood that he's sprinkling the nations with is his own, mm. right? He is a, his own sacrifice that he is offering. And he actually goes through death. He's cut off from the land of the living. He's buried in, in with the wicked. Verse 10, Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. So now we see the resurrection from the dead. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge of the righteous one, my servant make many. He shall be accounted righteous. He shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many. He shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Mm. So here we see the death and resurrection of God's Messiah. We see that he performs a priestly capacity. Uh, he has the sacrifice that he's bearing and sprinkling the nations with is mm. his own. We see that um, he has um, seed or offspring. The Hebrew word there is zira. And if you talk to um, many Muslims or Orthodox Jews, they might tell you that the word there for seed or zira means always refers to a literal offspring, and therefore mm. um, he's dis uh, Jesus is disqualified since he had no seed. Now, um, there's uh, actually an irony there because um, many um, I've I've seen quite a number of Muslims and Orthodox Jews try to s suggest that maybe it's Jeremiah that's in view here, um, and the problem, of course, with that is that in, in Jeremiah 16, it says, specifically says that Jeremiah was not to take to himself a wife or have children. So mm. the, the, there are, there's a bit of inconsistency there. <laughs> um, when, when Muslims or Orthodox Jews, although it's not the mainstream view, take that view. Um, now, the word zero actually uh, refer, can, refer to, can be used in a metaphorical or allegorical sense. Uh, for example, um, Isaiah, um, early, in the early chapters of Isaiah, speaks about um, you you um, seed of an adulterer, you seed of evildoers, um, uh, and, and so forth. Um, and so the, the word seed there could be used in an allegorical or metaphorical sense. Now, um, the, the, I mean, the mainstream view um, today um, of Isaiah 53 among Orthodox Jews is that it refers to the nation of Israel, mm. um, or a righteous remnant within Israel. And there's a number of problems with that. For one thing, it says, um, they made it in verse 9, they made his grave for the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Um, 
And it, uh, we also read that it was for the transgressions of, um, in fact, verse 8, the previous verse says that he was stricken for the transgression of my people. Yeah. And my people always refers to the nation of Israel. Mm. Um, and so it makes no sense to say he was stricken for the transgression of my people Israel, having himself done no wrong and there was no deceit in his mouth. That wouldn't make any sense. And indeed, Isaiah um, elsewhere, for example, in Isaiah 6 says, I am undone, I am a man of unclean lips, and I live in the midst of a people of unclean lips, mm. and my eyes have seen the King, Lord of hosts. Well, surely Isaiah would have to count within the righteous remnant of Israel, right? And he even says that his own lips are unclean. Yeah, and he sure. says he lives in the midst of a people of unclean lips. So that's, I think, um, a good argument against it being the, the um, personification of the nation of Israel. Now, if we go back to um, chapter 49 of Isaiah, Isaiah says, Listen to me, O coastlands, and give attention to peoples from afar. The Lord called me from the womb. From the body of my mother he named my name. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow mm. of his hand he hid me. He made me a polished arrow. In his quiver he hid me away. And he said, You are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing in vanity. Yet surely my right is with the Lord, and my recompense with my God. And now the Lord said, He who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has become my strength. So here we see an, an individual who bears the title of Israel, who redeems and regathers national Israel. Mm. So we have this individual called Israel, who is then distinguished and contrasted with the national Israel. And his job description is to regather national Israel. Uh, and this, of course, relates to the New Testament, especially Matthew, where they present Jesus as the new Israel. Yes. Um, for example, in Matthew 4, mm -hmm. where Jesus is 40 days in the wilderness, and quotes from Deuteronomy 8, mentioned by bread alone, which is the very text that deals with Israel being in the wilderness for 40 years. And yeah. why Matthew quotes Hosea 11.1 1 of Jesus, it's out of Egypt I have called my son, which refers, of course, in Hosea 11.1 1 to, to Israel. Mm. But Matthew applies it to Jesus because Jesus is the new Israel. And of course, in Matthew 2, we see this role reversal where um, Herod um, is trying to kill the infant babies of Bethlehem, just as Pharaoh killed the infant babies of Egypt, uh, the Hebrew babies in Egypt. And, and so Jesus leaves Egypt it le leaves Canaan, the promised land, for Egypt, which is the place of safety, yeah. just as Israel left Egypt for Canaan. So you see this rule reversal, which, by the way, is why uh, Matthew quotes out of Egypt to call my son when he's leaving, um, when he's leaving Bethlehem to go to Egypt, not when he's coming out of Egypt. So that's just um, um, by the way. But we continue reading in, in Isaiah 49. So we've read, um, now the Lord says, he of Fort, this is verse 5, the Lord says, He who formed me from the womb to be a servant, to bring Jacob back to him, that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has become my strength. He says, It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob, to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. And already we see this starts to connect with Isaiah 53, because mm -hmm. in Isaiah 52, we read that, uh, that he sprinkles many nations, right? So we start to see evidence that this is the same servant that we read of in Isaiah 53. It also says, Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and His Holy One, to one deeply despised, the poor by the nations, the servant of rulers, kings shall see and arise. Sound yes. familiar? Princes, and they shall prostrate themselves because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. Yes. And this reminds us, of course, of what we read, of what we read in Isaiah 52. Uh, verse 15, kings will shut their mouths because of him, for that which they've not been told them they see, that which they've not heard they understand. Yeah, sure. So it's the same servant in view in Isaiah 49. Now, in Isaiah 42, we also read about this same servant. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen whom my soul delights. I put my spirit upon him. Mm. He will bring forth justice to the nations. Mm. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the streets. A bridge reed he will not break and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged mm. till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his law. And so again, we see him uh, being a, a light for the nations, which will come even more explicit and mm. shortly. Thus says God, the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who goes breath to the earth on it and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the peoples, a light for the nations to open eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. And so we see that he's also a light for the nations. His job description to establish worldwide peace is the same as that in Isaiah 49. Yeah, for sure. um, he establishes justice in the world. So it's the same servant in Isaiah 42, 49, 53. 
And furthermore, we can see that in Isaiah 42, the righteous servant is actually contrasted with the unrighteous servant Israel. In Isaiah 42, verse 18, Hear you deaf, look you blind that you may see, who is blind but my servant, or deaf is my messenger whom I send, who is blind is my dedicated one, or blind is the servant of the Lord. Mm. So here we have this great contrast, which is why in Isaiah 49, the righteous servant is called by the title Israel, even while being distinguished from Israel, because he fulfills where Israel went wrong. He, yes, goes, he does right where Israel went wrong. Now, if we go back to Isaiah 11, we have a description of this very same servant again. It says, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, a branch from his root shall bear fruit. Um, and this reminds us, of course, in Isaiah 53, uh, mm -hmm. Verse 1, it says that um, a, a root out of dry ground, right? Yes. And actually, the word for root that's used in Isaiah 53, Sheresh, is also used in Isaiah 11 mm -hmm. to refer to this, this individual as well. The sp um, branch from his root shall bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Where have you read that before? Mm -hmm. Well, in Isaiah 42, it said that... Um, Isaiah, Isaiah 42 says, Behold my servant, whom I pull my chosen, whom I sold to light, that I put my Spirit upon him. Yeah. So, again, the same description. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see, or decide disputes by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor, and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. Mm. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, very similar language to Isaiah 49 as well, and with his, the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist, and faithfulness the belt of his loins. And so he establishes worldwide peace and justice, very same thing as what we saw in Isaiah 42, 49. Also in verse 10 it says, In that day the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for the peoples, of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. So again, the nations inquire of him, the nations rally to him, just as we saw in these other texts in Isaiah. He's a light for the nations. Then finally, we turn back to um, chapter 9 of Isaiah. We're reading about the very same individual again. Verse 1, There will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the latter time he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. So again, it connects with this uh, being a light for the Gentiles theme. Verse 2, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. Um, it reminds us of what we also read in um, Isaiah um, 42, mm. where it says, um, where, where it says, uh, um, I, I will give you as a covenant of the people, a light for the nations, mm. uh, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out from the dungeon, from the uh, bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison those who sit in darkness. A very mm. similar language again. Um, and then if we um, skip down to verse 6, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, the government should be upon his shoulder, and his name should be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, mm. Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace will be no end. On the throne of David, and that connects of course with Isaiah 11, a bit being the root of Jesse, and uh, the stump of Jesse, and over his kingdom to establish and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Mm. So here we see that the same individual spoken of in Isaiah 9 is the same as Isaiah 11, 42, 49, 53. And this very individual is called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Father of Eternity, meaning mm. the creator of all things. And he's called um, Mighty God, a title used in Isaiah 10, 21, the very next chapter of Yahweh. Mm. It says the remnant shall return to the Mighty God in Isaiah 10, 21. And the title Wonderful Counselor is also used um, of Yahweh. For example, in Isaiah um, 28, verse uh, 29, this also comes from the Lord of hosts. He is wonderful in counsel. Mm. Um, and, uh, and, and so we can see that the titles of deity in Isaiah 9 also have to be applied to the Isaiah 53 servant. Yeah, fantastic. And we also, in, in Zechariah 9, we read... Um, uh, another Messianic prophecy which connects and dovetails with those texts that we read in Isaiah. And Zechariah 9 says, from verse 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on the colt the full of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem. And the battle bow should be cut off, and he should speak peace to the nations. Very same description as Isaiah. His rule should be from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth. Again, he ex exercises worldwide dominion. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, the blood of what covenant? The blood of Christ. Mm -hmm. I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Sound familiar? Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. Today I declare that I will restore to you double, etc. 
Now, so here we see this messianic, messi messianic king of Israel riding in triumphantly to the streets of Jerusalem, saddled on the back of a donkey. Now, it's the same as individual from Isaiah. But when we turn to chapter 14 of Zechariah, we learn about the great day of the Lord when God will mm. um, oppose the nations who are encamped and gathered against Jerusalem for battle. It says, Behold, a day is coming for the Lord. Verse 1, When the spoil mm. taken from you will be divided in your midst, for I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city should be taken and the houses plundered and the women raped. Half the city should go out into exile, but the rest of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. On that day his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two, for, uh, from, in two from east to west by a very wide valley. So the one half the Mount shall move northward and the other half southward. So here we see that Yahweh has physical feet that mm. stand on the Mount of Olives, mm -hmm. which of course, is, of course is recalled in Acts chapter 1, where the disciples see Jesus ascend from the Mount of Olives and the angels tell the disciples, this Jesus, whom you shall go up into heaven, will come the same way you saw him go. In other words, his feet will stand on the men of olives. So you're, there you have the deity of Christ in the first chapter of Acts. Mm -hmm. and, and then it goes on. You shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach to Azel. And you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come, and all the holy ones with him. A text that's recalled in 1 Thessalonians 3, at the coming of Jesus Christ with all his saints. Yes. So then it goes on. And that day there'll be no light, cold or frost, and there'll be, no, there'll be a unique day which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night, but at evening time there shall be night. On that day living water shall flow out from Jerusalem, half them to the eastern sea, half them to the western sea. It shall come in summer as in winter, which of course recalls Ezekiel 47 with the, mm -hmm. the, found of the living water flowing from the temple. And of course in Revelation, the Lamb of God is the temple. And so the, you see the living water is flowing from the throne of the Lamb there as well. Verse 9, and Yahweh will be king over all the earth, and that day Yahweh will be one, and his name one. Verse 9 is the kicker, that, and that day Yahweh is to be one, he is to be king over all the earth. But we read in Zechariah 9 that Messiah was to be king over all the earth. Well, which Absolutely. is it? Well, it's both because Messiah is Yahweh. And so here we see again that um, this individual is um, Yahweh. And it, it's not just me interpreting it this way. In fact, Scripture itself interprets it Absolutely. that way. So Zephaniah 3 says... Um, Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. So here we see in that very same context where it's very similar to Zechariah 9, it says that the King of Israel is the Lord himself. Absolutely. Um, and it says, On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear not. Let not your hands grow weary. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one he will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. I will gather those of you who mourn for the festival, so that you will no longer suffer reproach. Behold, at that time I will deal with all your oppressors, and I will save the lame and gather the outcast. I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time I will bring you in. At the time when I gather you together, for I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth, when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. Again, that exact same expression was used in Zechariah 9. Yes. So the king then is taken to be Yahweh once again. So scripture is so it's incredible. rich and deep. And you also used Malachi 3 verse 1, where it shows that the one that precursed the one to come, which is John, mm. uh, precursors the coming of Yahweh himself. Do you want to mm. take us through that as well? Yeah, absolutely. So... Um, Malachi 3, um, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord, ha Adon, title only ever used of Yahweh, whom you seek, will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. Now, the New Testament, in various passages, applies this text to Jesus. Um, Mark 1, first three verses, for example, in the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, um, as it says in Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, pray the way of Yahweh, etc. And it, it basically conflates both Isaiah 40 verse 3 and Malachi 3 verse 1. Mm. Um, Jesus himself in, uh, in uh, Matthew chapter 11 identifies John the Baptist as the forerunner spoken of here in Malachi. And so if John the Baptist is the forerunner, then who does that make Jesus? It makes him Yahweh. And the context, mm. of course, of that is John the Baptist sent disciples to Jesus asking him, are you the Christ? And he says, well, the one that was prophesied to foreshadow me is John the Baptist. And so he identifies himself as the Ha'adon from Malachi 3. So when 
Muslims like to ask, where did Jesus ever say, I am God, worship me? Well, Ta-da. there it is. Ta-da. <laughs> yeah. um, now, um, let's unpack Malachi 3 a bit further. Um, Behold, I send a messenger, he will prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. Now, who is the messenger of the covenant according to Scripture? Well, to find out, let's go to the book of Judges and chapter 2. Um, the book of Judges, chapter 2. Now, the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochim, and he said, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land that I swore to give to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you, and you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land, etc. Um, so, the angel of the Lord, or the Melach Yahweh in, mm. in Hebrew, which literally means the messenger of Yahweh, much like the Greek word angelos, Malach in Hebrew can refer to angel, it can refer to messenger, it's even mm. used of, uh, um, use of God in some cases. And Malachi means my messenger, for example. Um, it's a possessive form. So, in Judges 2, the messenger of the covenant is identified as the messenger of the Lord, who is identified as um, a divine person, Throughout Scripture, um, Isaiah 63 speaks about three divine persons, um, one of whom is the Father, who is described, who's described as the Father to his people Israel, one of whom is the Holy Spirit, who is described in similar language to Yahweh in Psalm 73:40, or sorry, Psalm 78:40, 40, um, and, mm. um, Isaiah, um, and also we have the messenger of the presence of Yahweh. Now, that's an allusion to, um, to Exodus 23. Um, verse 20 and 21. Um, and in Exodus 23, 20 and 21, we read, Behold, I send an angel or a messenger before you to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place I have prepared. Be careful attention to him and obey his voice. Do not rebel against him, for he will not pardon your transgression, for my name is in him. In other words, he buries the very name and presence of God himself. And so he has the prerogative and authority to forgive sins and to withhold forgiveness of sins. Mm. Um, something that's a prerogative only of Yahweh. And of course, in the book of Zechariah, in chapter 3, we learn that he, he's, he claims credit for removing the sins of Israel, removing the sins of Joshua, who, who's a type of Israel, um, when he removes the filthy garments from him and says um, in, verse, uh, in verse 4, uh, Behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. So, the angel of the Lord is Yahweh. And he's a divine person. And yet he's also distinguished from Yahweh in some sense because he is a second person of the Godhead, I would argue. But in Exodus 23, 20 and 21, it says, Behold, I send an angel or a messenger before you to guard you on the way. Does that sound familiar from anywhere? Well, we just read from Malachi hmm. chapter 3, the very similar language where it said, um, it said, Behold, I send my messenger. He will prepare the way before me. So, Malachi 3 turns out to be the reversal of Exodus 23, verse 20. And this, uh, just as in Exodus 20 through 20, you have, uh, um, you have uh, the messenger of the Lord preparing the way for the people of Israel. In Malachi 3, we have an Israelite, a Hebrew, preparing the way for the messenger of Yahweh. Amazing. So you have the reversal there. That's amazing. Well, we looked at the undesigned coincidence as we looked at messianic prophecies. Can we look at some non-Messianic mm. prophecies? Give us one example yeah. of that, and then we can close it for extra biblical evidence. Sure. So let's go to the book of uh, Ezekiel, um, in chapter number 26. Uh, um, this is um, a prophecy that God gives against, uh, against Tyre, which is the capital of the Phoenician Empire. It was known as the Queen of the Seas. It was, uh, it was a center of trade and commerce in the ancient world. It was considered impregnable. And, and yet God promises a destruction of the city of Tyre. It says, In the eleventh year, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, because Tyre said concerning Jerusalem, Aha, the gate of the peoples is broken. It has swung open to me, I shall be replenished. Now that she has laid waste, therefore thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Tyre, and will bring up many nations against you, as the sea brings up its waves. They shall destroy the walls of Tyre, and break down her towers, and I will scrape her soil from her, and make her a bare rock. She shall be in the midst of the sea, a place for the spreading of nets, for I have spoken, declares the Lord God. And she shall become plunder for the nations, and her daughters on the mainland shall be killed by the sword. Then they will know that I am the Lord. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will bring against uh, against Tyre from the north, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, king of kings, with horses and chariots, and with horsemen, and a host of many soldiers. And he will kill with the sword your daughters in the mainland. 
He will set up siege, a siege wall against you, and throw up a mound against you, and raise a roof of shields against you. He will direct the shock of his battering rams against your walls, and with axes he will break down your towers. His horses will be so many that their dust will cover you. Your wall will sh walls will shake at the noise of his horsemen and wagons and chariots when he enters your gates, as men enter a city that has been breached. With the hoofs of his chariots he will trample all your streets. He will kill your people with the sword, and your mighty pillars will fall to the ground. They will, plund they will plunder your riches and loot your merchandise. They will break down your walls and destroy your pleasant horse houses. Your stones and timber and soil they will cast into the midst of the waters. And I will stop the music of your songs, and the song of your lives will be heard no more. I will make you a bare rock. You will be a place for the spreading of nets. You will never be rebuilt, for I am the Lord. I have spoken, declares the Lord God. So here we see um, God's um, promise of judgment against the nation, uh, against uh, the, Ty, the city of Tyre, the capital of the Phoenician Empire. Now it's important to understand that the city of Tyre, there was a mainland city of Tyre, and there was also an island city of Tyre. And um, God promises to bring against Tyre many nations who are to come up as the sea brings up its waves against the shore. So they're to come in sets, right? They're to come in sets against Tyre. And it's that their job description is to destroy the walls of Tyre, break down her towers, and scrape her soil from her and make her a bare rock. So she's to be cast into the midst of the sea. And she used to be a place for the spreading of nets, meaning she's now underwater, right? And, of course, uh, the first part of this prophecy is fulfilled by Nebuchadnezzar, who marched against the city of Tyre. There was a 13-year siege in the 6th century by uh, Nebuchadnezzar. And uh, he, uh, it was a land siege. Nebuchadnezzar had no navy. Um, and so uh, this is a land assault against the city of Tyre. Uh, he, bar he surrounded the city of Tyre and besieged it for 13 years. The people of Tyre had an idea. They decided to um, evacuate their personnel and all their, all their um, possessions, from uh, all their resources, from Tyre and take it to the island city of Tyre off the coast because Tyre had a very powerful navy. The Phoenician Empire had a very powerful navy and it was the, Tyre was the queen of the seas. They were impregnable from the, from the, from the sea. So they... Um, basically evacuated by boat over to the island city of Tyre. Then eventually, after 13 years besieging Tyre, Nebuchadnezzar breached the walls of Tyre and was a bit disappointed because there was no one there. Right? Yeah, and uh, so he wasn't able to, um, to loot very much from Tyre and, or kill very many people. But, um, and, and so, in fact, uh, Ezekiel 29 speaks about his failure. Um, it says in verse... Uh, uh, 17 and following. In the 27th year, in the first month, in the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, made his army labor hard against Tyre. Every head was made bald. Every shoulder was rubbed bare. Yet neither he nor his army got anything from Tyre to pay for the labor that he performed against her. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will give the land of Egypt to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. He shall carry off its wealth and despoil it and plunder it. And it shall, have, it shall be the wages for his army. Etc. So, Nebuchadnezzar fails in his destruction, uh, in his plundering and looting of Tyre, um, even though he's able to breach the city walls. So then fast forward till 330, 332 AD, when Alexander the Great marched against Tyre. And the people of Tyre thought they'd do the same thing. They'd evacuate to the island city of Tyre. But Alexander wasn't having any of it. Uh, he went straight in, breached the walls of Tyre, and um, raised the city of Tyre to the ground. And then uh, he turned his attention to the island city of Tyre. And how does he get to the island city of Tyre? Well, he builds a causeway from the mainland to the island city of Tyre by dumping the rubble from t of Tyre into the ocean to build himself a causeway. And so in a very literal way, this prophecy is fulfilled right down to the letter that the city of Tyre was cast into the midst of the ocean. Mm and became a place for the spreading of nets because it's now underwater. And, uh, and so it's, it's very specific and it's very precise, and yet it comes to fruition in the conquest of Alexander the Great. Now, um, and, and so um, the skeptical way of reading this passage is to read the whole thing and attribute all of it to Nebuchadnezzar and argue it's a failed prophecy. Yeah, sure. But notice that when you get to verse 12 of Ezekiel 26, it switches from the singular pronouns he 
to the plural pronoun they, they will plunder your riches and loot your merchandise. They will break down your walls and destroy your pleasant houses. Your stones and timbers and soil they will cast into the midst of the waters. Uh, and I will stop the music of your songs and the sound of your lyres shall be heard no more. I will make you a bare rock. You shall be a place for the spreading of nets. You shall never be rebuilt, etc. The job description that's given to the they of verse 12 is the same as was given to the many nations mm. at the beginning of the chapter, right? Nebuchadnezzar was simply zoomed in on because he was the closest in temporal proximity. He was the one that was immediately on the horizon to come against Tyre. Um, and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and so the, the, and given that many nations were to come up against Tyre, the job was not to be completed by Nebuchadnezzar. Um, the many nations, I would argue, would be the multinational force of Alexander the Great yeah, that sure. comes up against the city of Tyre. Furthermore, um, in the book of Zechariah, and uh, chapter number nine, uh, we read, uh, and uh, it says, the oracle of this verse one, the oracle of the Lord of the, uh, the oracle of the word of the Lord is against the land of Hadrach, and Damascus is his resting place. For the Lord is an eye on mankind, and all the tribes of Israel, and on Hamath also, <coughs> which brought her on it, Tyre and Sidon, though they are wise. Tyre has built herself a rampart and heaped up silver like dust and find gold like the mud of the streets. But behold, the Lord will strip her of her possessions and strike down her power on the sea, and she shall be devoured by fire. Right? Now, there's actually a timestamp of this prophecy because in Zechariah 7, it says, In the fourth year of King Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah on the fourth day of the ninth month, which is Shiv Shizlev. Now, that timestamp sets the writing of this prophecy in Zechariah decades after the the completion of Nebuchadnezzar's siege against Tyre, and yet it's still d predicting the destruction of Tyre, which mm. um, so it's a future event still. And of course, it was Alexander the Great that sets the city ablaze on fire, and uh, and then dumps the city, the rubble of Tyre, into the midst of the ocean. Uh, so we have some really remarkable confirmation of uh, prophecy from from that history. That's incredible. Well, give us one example of extra biblical evidences for the Bible being evidence based. Yeah. So. Um, there's um, a number of ways that uh, apologists uh, and scholars have tried to argue for the Bible being um, historically confirmed. I'm thinking in particular of the New Testament. Uh, for example, people talk about um, the Flavianum Testimonium in uh, Antiquities of the Jews by Flavius Josephus, uh, which is in volume 18, or they talk about um, Tacitus, Annals of Imperial Rome, mentioning. Uh, Jesus, who was executed under the reign of Tiberius Caesar um, at the hands of Pro um, Pontius Pilate, one of our procurators, and so forth. Um, and there's, I, I don't like to use those direct passages because um, they only confirm at best what was understood, what was being said by the Christians of the first century, which we already mm -hmm. know from the New Testament. So they don't really contribute much. Uh, also, the testimony of Flavianum and Book 18 of Antiquities of the Jews is famously disputed as to how much of it is authentic. Yeah. Uh, it seems to have undergone interpolation by a later overzeal overzealous Christian scribe. Josephus almost certainly didn't call Jesus the Messiah, for example. Mm. Um, but can we, in, in fact, um, nonetheless use extra biblical corroborations of Scripture in the New Testament, and how can we go about that? I think that the better way of arguing from extra biblical corroborations is to argue for patterns that are similar to the undesigned coincidences we talked about earlier but between the Gospels or Acts and external secular sources. Yeah, for sure. So let me give you um, two or three examples quickly. Um, in, uh, in Matthew chapter 2, we learn that um, Joseph was uh, returning from Egypt after he heard about the death of Herod the Great, who was trying to seek the life of Jesus. Mm. Herod the Great died around 4 BC. And uh, on his way back, he suddenly becomes aware or learns or hears that Herod Archelaus, Herod the Great's son, is now reigning in place, of his father, in place of his father Herod in Judea. So now he's very afraid to go there. So he goes via Galilee instead. So this raises an interesting question. Why was he so afraid of Archelaus? It's the one time we read about him in Scripture. Well, um, Jos uh, Josephus tells us that one of the um, last things that Herod the Great did before his death was to have certain Jews executed for their part in having removed the Roman eagle from the Jewish temple. Mm. And because the Jews are obsessed with the second commandment, not having graven images, and so they were very upset about this, so they removed the Roman eagle from the Jewish temple. Herod the Great found out who was responsible and had them brutally killed. <laughs> and then the time for Herod's death came, he died, 
And then there was uh, uh, the, the Jewish Passover. So Archelaus began to reign as, um, in place. It was Father Herod. And the Jewish Passover festival rolled around. Um, and, uh, or I should mention, that Herod the Great's territory was divided among his sons. So Herod Archelaus uh, became um, ruler in Judea, and his younger brother Herod Antipas became ruler in Galilee. Um, so um, the Jewish Passover festival rolled around, and there was an influx of Jewish pilgrims coming into Jerusalem for Passover. And there was an argument struck up between a mob of Jewish men and some Roman soldiers over what happened to their friends. The Jewish, Jewish men picked up stones and they stoned the Roman soldiers to death. Bad idea. Um, and they, Josephus tells us that they picked up their sacrifices for the Passover and ran into the Jewish temple. Archelaus was enraged at this threat upon his government, so he, he rounded up his entire army and sent his entire army upon the Jewish temple. He surrounded the temple with the horsemen and told them do not let anyone leave or enter the temple. He sent the foot soldiers into the temple and told them kill everyone you find. So they killed 3,000 Jews that day. And then he announced to those outside the temple, Passover is cancelled. Return to your homes. And so you can imagine poor Joseph on his way back from Egypt to Judea encountering this massive fleeing pilgrims coming out of Judea, hearing what just happened and thinking, hmm, I, Maybe it's not I fled idea. from a, a, <laughs> mini, a maniac of a king. Yeah, Maybe I should sure. not return to another maniac of a king. <laughs> and so instead of going to Judea, he goes via Galilee, where his younger brother Herod Antipas is reigning instead. Um, and so then that illuminates the biblical narrative in a way that points to truth um, mm -hmm. and the verisimilitude of the narrative. Uh, another example is um, um, in, in uh, the Gospel of Mark and chapter 10, Jesus is giving teaching about divorce. And... Um, it says in verse 10, In the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter, and he said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her, and if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. Now this raises a problem, and critical scholars latch onto this, that Jewish law made no provision for a woman to divorce her husband. It only made provision for a uh, husband to divorce his wife. Mm. And the allegation is that Mark here has deliberately fudged Jesus' teaching to make it suitable for a Roman audience where a female can initiate divorce proceedings. Or perhaps he's actually a Gentile and he here portrays his ignorance of Jewish law. So is Mark an error here? Well, according to Josephus, um, Herod um, Antipas had divorced his, his wife in order to marry the wife of his own uh, brother, Philip's, uh, the, his own brother Philip. Um, her name was Herodias. Mm. And so he was involved in this adulterous relationship with Herodias. And Josephus tells us that Herodias took it upon herself to, to confound the laws of her country to divorce her first husband, Philip, in order to marry Herod Antipas. Now, where was Herod Antipas tetrarch? He was tetrarch of Galilee, the very place Jesus gave this teaching. Mm. And so then that, that historical background then illuminates what's going on there. Now, it turns out that Herodias ran home to her daddy, um, um, who was... Um, um, uh, sorry, um, sorry, not Herodias. Um, uh, uh, um, Herod's, wife, Herod's um, former wife that he divorced ran home to her father, um, who was Aretas IV, king of the Nabataeans. And uh, this resulted in a war between uh, Herod Antipas and Aretas IV, king of the Nabataeans. And, um, and in fact, Herod lost the war, and the people blamed, the Jews blamed it on what Herod had done to John the Baptist, having him killed. Mm. Which is interesting because, according to the Gospels, the reason Herod didn't like John the Baptist was because he, he criticized him for his relationship with Herodias, the wife of Philip, his own brother. Um, and, and so then that illuminates the biblical narrative again in the way that points the truth. Furthermore, uh, uh, jo um, Josephus also has a narrative about the martyrdom of John the Baptist. And he... And, he illuminates something interesting in Mark 6, where, which narrates the martyrdom of John the Baptist, because John the Baptist um, was executed, Mark tells us, by the Greek word that's used is a speculatura, which is mm. the word for a, a scout or a military officer. Mm. Why not use a civil executioner? Well, Josephus tells us that at the time, Herod was not at his palace in Galilee, but was on a military campaign at his, pa at his military fortress in Machaerus which then illuminates why he didn't use a civil executioner, but a military officer to carry out the execution. Furthermore, um, we, um, and Herod, so Herod had built this military citadel, this military fortress called Machaerus at the north corner of the Dead Sea. And, uh, the, um, uh, and the Jordan River 
flows north to south into the Dead Sea. Now, where, what was happening at the Jordan River? John the Baptist was baptizing. And in Luke chapter 3, we, re we read um, verse 10, The crowds asked John the Baptist, What then shall we do? And he answered them, Whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has, an, who has none, and whoever has food is to do likewise. Tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than you are authorized to do. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what shall we do? And he said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation, and be content with your wages. Now, the Greek word that's used for soldiers here is an active participle. It literally means those being soldiers or those soldiering. Uh, so these are soldiers on active duty at a time of relative peace in Palestine. And there's only one military conflict going on at this time, and that's the conflict between Herod the Great and his former father-in-law, Aratus IV, king of the Nabataeans. Now, as I mentioned, Josephus tells us that Herod had built this military fortress at the north corner of the Dead Sea called Machaerus. And the Jordan River flows north to south into the Dead Sea. So these soldiers happen to be directly on their, they're on their way to shore up the military garrison at Machaerus, and their path is directly where John the Baptist is baptizing. Mm. And so then it illuminates again the biblical narrative. Um, one final example from Acts is in Acts 23, we have um, 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 the Apostle Paul has been apprehended and he's brought before the Jewish council. Mm -hmm. uh, the, Ananias, the chief priest, asks for him to be struck on the mouth. And Paul said to him in verse 3, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Are you sitting in to judge me according to the law, and yet contrary to the law, you ordered me to be struck? Those who stood by said, Would you revile God's high priest? And Paul said, I did not know, brothers, that he was the high priest, for it is written, You shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. Now, why does Paul not know who the high priest is? Right? Someone who's trained under Gamaliel, was a former Pharisee, surely he could even tell by the way he was dressed. Right? And mm -hmm. Why does he not know who the high priest is? Well, Flavius Josephus tells us that around this time, which is around 58 AD, which is the time approximately when Paul was apprehended and brought before the Jewish council, Ananias actually was not the high priest, but he was sitting in judgment in that assumed capacity. So the, the situation was he previously held the office, he'd been deposed, the person who'd replaced him called Jonathan had been murdered, and, the per and uh, another had not yet been appointed to the station. So during the vacancy, he had of his own authority taken upon himself the discharge of the office. So then that illuminates Paul's words. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't realize he was a high priest, <laughs> yeah. right? Um, now, in the book of Acts alone, I can give you more than 100 examples of extra biblical, biblical corroboration that supports it. Um, if people want more examples, uh, Craig Keener's commentary in the book of Acts, four-volume set, uh, covers a lot of this. Um, also, a um, book by Colin Hemer, the book of Acts in the setting of Hellenistic history, uh, covers this stuff as well. Um, so, um, yeah, there's, there's uh, many resources. Also, James Smith's book, The Voyage and Shipwreck of St. Paul, covers um, evidence for the Voyage and Shipwreck of St. Paul in Acts 27. So there's plenty of resources where you can read more of this stuff. That is incredible. Well, Jonathan, thank you so much. I think we've given the listening audience quite a lot to think through and to mm -hmm. work through to show them that the Bible is evidence-based. So thank you for your time. And uh, hopefully when you come back to South Africa next year, we'll do something else. and make sure that we also answer some questions. Absolutely. So thank you for that. Thank you.